a 16-year-old girl who shared a home with her parents and younger sisters, had gone to bed in her room when she was discovered dead the next morning. None of her family members heard anything that night, but the police understood they were dealing with a mu asterisk der right away. No one was ready for this sequence of events, which took 31 years to eventually solve. In Kansas City, Missouri, on March 24, 1973, Fawn Cox was born. Two more girls were shortly born to her parents. The family was housed in a modest two-story home in a rundown area. She attended church regularly, enjoyed swimming, and assisted her parents in raising their younger children from a young age. Fawn began working part-time at a nearby theme park when she was 16 years old. The kid wanted to work during her free time from school in order to help her family, who were quite underprivileged. She worked most of her 1989 summer vacations. The girl primarily worked behind the cash register, selling amusement ride tickets. At around 10 p.m. on July 26, she concluded her shift. Since it would have taken a while for her to ride the bus from the park to her house, her mother and younger sister drove to fetch her up. Fawn went to bed shortly after getting home because she had to go to work the next morning. On the second floor, the girl slept. She had a private space. She typically shared a room with her sisters for sleep. But that particular night, she was by herself on the floor. That evening, her sister Amber, who was just a year younger, was watching children for a well-known family. Felicia, the second sister, chose to spend the night on the first level because it was significantly cooler. They slept on the first floor with their parents because it was an extremely hot night and there was only one air conditioner operating below. The alarm clock in Fawn's room woke everyone up the following morning at around 9 in the morning, but for some reason the child wouldn't turn it off. Then her mother and younger sister entered her chamber, where they found a horrifying scene. Fawn was motionless as she lay on the bed, her neck clearly damaged. The girl's parents contacted an ambulance right away because she too had no pulse, but they were no longer able to assist her. It was clear that Fawn had died a few hours earlier. Medical examiners found that the girl had been abused in addition to being strangled as the cause of death. The cops were aware from the start that they had an extremely challenging inquiry. Fawn's parents and sister were completely silent when she was murdered in her chamber in a tiny house with terrible soundproofing. But there was a justification. Old and loud, the air conditioner on the first level drowned out all other noise in the residence. Fawn's sister was the only one who observed anything odd that evening. They paid little attention to their poodle's nervous behavior and barking. The dog's pregnancy was thought to be the cause of this behavior. The cops investigated the scene and found numerous significant items. Their hypothesis was that the assailant or assailants had entered the home through a window on the second floor that looked out onto the backyard. The canopy of the outbuilding, which was almost level with the window, could be reached by using an old trailer that was parked close to the house. Since there was no air conditioning on the second story, the window had been left open as a means of cooling off. The first significant clues were discovered in Fawn's room, including a few short hairs, little blood stains, and traces of semen on the bedsheet. This was everything delivered to the lab for evaluation. The home also lacked a few things, like radios, a Nintendo gaming system, and a stereo recorder. On the ground in front of the house, further objects were discovered. The burglar appeared to have thrown them out the window in an attempt to take them with him, but for some reason he left them there. Additionally, the detectives discovered that other goods had been taken from a closet in an adjacent second-floor room. They thought the offender was waiting for everyone to fall asleep in the house while lurking in that closet. Fawn's sister usually slept in that room, but not on that particular night. Because of this, Nobody took note of the objects on display. Another peculiar clue was found by the cops. In Fawn's chamber, worn-out army headgear was discovered. Everyone in her family claimed to have never seen the girl wearing it. Detectives therefore suspected that the murderer may have left the headgear at the site. Police struggled to immediately identify the suspects, despite an incredible amount of evidence. The issue is that in 1989, DNA forensics was still in its infancy and there were no widely used genetic databases. Detective Benjamin Caldwell, who was in charge of the case, gave the primary account of what happened. He thought there might have been numerous attackers, and they must have been familiar with the house. They must have understood the layout of the rooms, in addition to knowing how to access the second story through the backyard in complete darkness. 
The police's next move was to search for witnesses. They questioned Fawn's acquaintances, neighbors, and family members, but none of their findings were conclusive. One significant issue awaited the detectives. The area where the property was situated was extremely underdeveloped and criminal. There were numerous criminal groups operating, and it was very challenging to prosecute their members. The investigation began a month after Fawn was killed. Because of a witness, the police were able to identify three suspects. This witness's account was taken seriously because he had access to crucial information that the police had withheld. Three teens, one of whom was in Fawn's class, were the suspects. The youngsters were detained and interrogated, but they steadfastly denied any involvement in the killing. Police discovered items taken from the victim's chamber during a search of one of their homes. Even though the evidence was sufficient to accuse all three of murder, the detectives remained dissatisfied. First, the witness abruptly changed his story and ceased helping the police. Second, a DNA match between the suspect's samples and blood, hair, and semen discovered at the crime scene could not be established. In those years, scientists were unable to determine a precise match between the samples, and all of their testing yielded uncertain results. In other words, the analysis was unable to confirm either a complete match or a guaranteed mismatch. Despite this, one of the captives was able to provide the authorities with important information. He admitted during one of the interrogations that he had in fact broken into Fawn's home that evening with other boys and taken some things. He depicted his passage through the canopy to the second floor and even disclosed untold details. He said he tossed a tape recorder out the window and the handle came off. The cops did discover the item exactly where the youngster had hidden it, below a neighboring shrub. If the young man hadn't swiftly withdrawn his testimony and stopped helping with the inquiry, his confession wouldn't have been admissible in court. As a result, the men had to be released by the police, which put an end to the ongoing inquiry. The witnesses were probably just intimidated, but the case would have had little to no chance without their testimony in court. We only know that one of them was imprisoned for eight months for stealing goods from Fawn's home. The case was then placed in a large drawer. The first action the police took upon reopening the case in the early 2000s was to upload DNA evidence from the crime scene to the CODIS database. It was made a number of years prior and contained DNA samples from defendants in major criminal trials. Sadly, there were no matches discovered for the Fawn murderer. This database was created as a result of significant developments in DNA research. Additionally, it enabled law enforcement to gather DNA samples from the three initial suspects and run more complex analyses. This time, experts unequivocally concluded that none of them were the source of the blood, semen, or hair. Given that the suspects were discovered in possession of Fawn's possessions, this was pretty strange. Detectives conjectured that although there was a fourth person with the three men who had allegedly looted her home that night, he was responsible for the girl's maltreatment and death. This led to even more unanswered questions. Could it be that four thieves broke into the home covertly, murdered Fawn, and then fled the scene of the crime? This question was unanswered by the police. The case has since been halted once more. The Fawn family's hope that the murder would ever be solved waned with each passing year. They persisted in their belief that the three suspects had spent the night at their residence and could have provided evidence against the murderer, but they never did. A DNA sample kept in the police lab was the only item that could reveal the truth to them. Something intriguing occurred in 2018. The younger sister of Fawn Amber disclosed some troubling information regarding the crime. She posted her opinions and details that the police were unaware of on a well-known American site for cold cases. The forum has been around for 20 years, during which time it has developed a solid reputation and its members have assisted the police in the resolution of a number of high-profile cases. Amber's post merits attention because it has been verified and proven that she is indeed who she claims to be. She was only at home during the daytime because she herself worked as a nanny from Monday through Friday. The girl slept in the exact second-floor room where the robbers had entered on weekends. As a result, the culprits would have been discovered right away. They would have also kept watch on the home and awaited the arrival of Fawn's mother and Fawn's younger sister to pick up the girl from school. Despite everything, Amber's story didn't help the case get any closer to being solved. However, it was already 2018, and DNA research science had advanced significantly. 
Thanks to modern analysis technologies, dozens, if not hundreds, of long-forgotten cases were being resolved. Fawn's family witnessed everything and was angry that the police were taking so long to reopen the murder case. Every time they discussed the case with investigators, they received the same response. Longer DNA tests cost money, and the police are working on dozens of cases. The family was therefore left to wait for their turn and the arrival of funding. But they made the decision to take the lead and started a fundraiser in 2019. The victim's family offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the perpetrator's capture, as well as complete payment for the DNA testing. Multiple people who cared reacted to plead for assistance as a result of the situation, receiving widespread media coverage and the family participating in multiple interviews. The family swiftly gathered the required sum of money, but even in this they were let down. The victim's family was forced to pay for the police department to launch this investigation. The main detective said that a significant issue was inevitable in such a circumstance. Hundreds of other families who have been looking for their loved one's murder for years should have the same right if the family of one victim was able to pay for such testing and expedite the results. However, because so few laboratories around the world perform cutting-edge DNA tests, and because of the sheer volume of people who want to do so, it is simply impossible to put such a thing into effect. Parabon Nanolabs, which we have constantly emphasized in previous reels, is the industry leader in this discipline. In the study of DNA, great strides have been made, from identifying a person's relatives from the smallest genetic samples to constructing a rough portrait of the DNA owner. This lab was going to take over the investigation of the samples found in Fawn's bedroom the night she was killed. The girl's family thought that the authorities were dragging their feet on their case for some other purpose. Because they were from a poor and undesirable community, homicide was not a top concern for the local police. In an interview, Sister Fawn claimed that the essential investigations would have been completed right away if the victim's family had been wealthy or in a position of authority. The long-awaited breakthrough finally occurred in late 2020, but they were unable to speed up the process in time because the family wasn't prepared for that kind of reality. The cops did transport samples from Fawn's room to a lab thanks to financing from the FBI. They started there by carefully examining the DNA and looking for a potential relative of its owners. They primarily used the semen sample that was recovered from the crime site. They were finally successful in identifying the owner of that DNA in November 2020. Donald Cox, Fawn's cousin, turned out to be the person. Naturally, the news surprised the family. Donald was 21 years old when Fawn died, and nobody had even thought about him being involved. Nevertheless, Donald had a lot of problems and was frequently imprisoned. He was put on trial for infractions like theft and drug possession. Unfortunately, they did not yet collect a DNA sample from such criminals during those years. If not, this case would have been resolved a lot sooner. Donald overdosed and passed away in 2006, but the police looked into it because of several suspicious-looking details. A sample of his DNA was saved as a result of that investigation, but it was not added to the FBI database because the individual in that case was a victim, not an offender. The sample was compared to the semen found at the crime scene, and when the experts told the authorities of their finding, they obtained a 100% match. Despite the seriousness of the revelation, the relatives have now learned the answer to a 31-year-old mystery. But the entire narrative was missing one crucial element. The three first suspects had also been in the Fawn house that night, according to a ton of evidence. The reason the culprits had such detailed knowledge of the home and the family's habits was now becoming apparent. Donald was a frequent guest and was aware of all these details. The three men weren't given any additional charges though, and the police closed the case. Despite the fact that the males were in the house that night, Sister Fawn claimed she saw no purpose in attempting to elicit a confession from them. They could not even have seen the murder take place. Donald might have remained inside the house by himself before attacking Fawn. The three suspects had already paid for their conduct, Felicia noted. Even though the case was still open at this point, everyone in the neighborhood was certain they were guilty. They received really poor treatment as a result, with all the resulting repercussions, Sister Fawn claimed that their lives had been effectively destroyed. Additionally, it was discovered after the investigation was finished that the police had first heard about the suspects from the relatives of one of them. A Nintendo set-top box was among his possessions, 
and the investigators recognized it as the one that had been taken from Fawn's home. Because the press covered it, everyone in the neighborhood was already aware of the specifics. In any instance, it is simply difficult to establish their guilt, and the victim's family already knows the killer's identity. He talked with his family throughout that period as if nothing had occurred and lived for 17 years without receiving any sort of penalty for what he had done. But eventually his addiction to illegal drugs drove him to death, and he was no longer a danger to anyone. Comment on this story with your thoughts, and don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. I appreciate you coming.